Obviously, it's the NBA offseason, and there's a lot of hate and negativity going around at these teams' decisions, so I want to spread some positive messages, so this is one positive thing about every NBA team this offseason. Let's get into it. For starting with the Atlanta Hawks, signing Trey Young to a max 5-year contract along with John Collins for the next 5 years is definitely a good thing, and this is going to make them competitive in the East for years to come. Also bringing along Gorgie Dang as he's a solid veteran who can both space out the floor and play some solid download defense will help them in a win now situation. For the Boston Celtics, Ennis Cantor is coming off of a solid season scoring wise and one of his best rebounding seasons ever. I think he's going to help out the Celtics as far as their down low scoring as well as improving their rebounding which was only 15th in the league last year. I also like the addition that Chris Dunn and Josh Richardson add to their backcourt. I like how the Nets were able to bring back Blake Griffin. Griffin was definitely a good contributor to them last year and probably meshed with the roster a lot better than I thought he was going to. Patty Mills is also a great pickup who should do a good job in replacing Spencer Dinwiddie this offseason. For the Charlotte Hornets, it does suck losing a young player like Devontae Graham in the offseason. But there are certainly worse sign and trade deals than they could have gotten than getting a lottery protected first round pick for him. Not to mention Ish Smith is an underrated veteran guard and James Knight looks like an explosive young scorer who I think could pair well in the future with LaMelo Ball. Mason Plumlee is also one of the best backup centers in the league, averaging 10 points, 10 rebounds, 3 assists, and a block per game this year coming off of the bench. For the Chicago Bulls, they're probably the biggest winners of the offseason. As you know, they got DeMar DeRozan, a 20 point per game scorer who is also a very good playmaker for his position. He has a skill set that I think is going to go well, especially with Vucevic, who many people forget is actually on this team, and of course, Zach Levine. Bringing in Lonzo Ball, Ball is a good defender, playmaker, and a shooter who can take some of the load off Levine. And yes, I said shooter, as Lonzo made three three-pointers per game while shooting 38% from the field. Alex Caruso is also a high-energy, scrappy player who's placed some of the top perimeter defense in the NBA while shooting 40% from three. Chicago just made the jump from missing the playoffs to likely being a mid-tier team in the East. For the Cavaliers, Evan Mobley definitely looks like a good prospect, having a strong game in both blocking shots and finishing down low. But it is also kind of weird to draft a center while giving Jared Allen a 5-year $120 million contract. So having two young centers, neither of which can really space out the floor, seems not like the best way to build a team around. But regardless, Jared Allen is coming off of a solid year rebounding, scoring, and defending down low. Both of these two look like good strong down low centers to match well with Colin Sexton. And Ricky Rubio is also an amazing playmaker to have either come off the bench or go alongside Sexton as he is more of a shooting guard nowadays. For the Dallas Mavericks, I love that they were able to bring back Tim Hardaway Jr. as he is still one of the top shooting guards in the league, shown to be a good scorer going along with Luka Doncic. And also, Boban Marjanovic is just a national treasure. The Dallas Mavericks were top 10 in the league in both 3-pointers made and attempted, but as far as their 3-point percentage as a team, that sat at only 18th in the league. Both Sterling Brown and Reggie Bullock, are two 40% 3-point shooters, should help the Mavs space out the floor and shoot at a better rate. For the Denver Nuggets, they of course have one of the best young cores in the league and don't really have to do too much this offseason. So by keeping the same core together, while also keeping in some veteran talents like Austin Rivers, Will Barton, bringing in Jeff Green, gives this roster a good combination of both young talent and veterans ready to win now and in the future. The Detroit Pistons definitely also have a bright future. While Corey Joseph and Kelly Olenek are both just okay veterans, the big win of their offseason is bringing in Cade Cunningham. Cunningham was the clear number one pick of this year's draft and has the makings of being a great all-around prospect and future star in the league. The Pistons also have plenty of young talent like Jeremy Grant to pair him with on this roster. For the Golden State Warriors, I love how they are able to secure Steph Curry to a four-year extension. This is going to keep Golden State relevant and when healthy, a contender for the next half decade. Otto Porter Jr. is also a pretty good 3 and D player who is just overpaid in Chicago, but now that he's signing at a veteran's minimum, I think he's going to be an incredibly good player for the Warriors. While the Houston Rockets did not make too much of a splash in free agency, as their only signing was David Nwaba, who had an improved season from just two years ago, Houston also got four prospects in the first round in Josh Christopher, Usman Garuba, Alperin Singun, and most notably their second round pick Jalen Green. 
This group of rookies should go a long way as Houston is continuing to undergo a large retooling period. For the Indiana Pacers, their 13th overall pick was Chris Duarte as he's coming off a 17-4-4 season while playing some amazing defense for the Oregon Ducks. As a 23 year old entering into the league, I imagine he's going to be one of the more polished players of this draft class. And TJ McConnell is also a good backup guard to have and Torrey Craig is still an amazing hustle player. For the Clippers, Keon Johnson has a solid inside scoring game and he seems like he's a pretty good off ball scorer and cutter for a rookie. And Nicholas Batum is also a 40% 3 point shooter that basically every team could use. Of course though, the main goal of the Clippers offseason is going to be bringing back Kawhi Leonard. The Lakers have undergone one of the weirdest offseasons I've ever seen. First off, they had virtually no cap space going into this, but by trading Kyle Kuzma, Montrezl Harrell, and Contavious Caldwell Pope with the first round pick for Russell Westbrook, an aging superstar with a huge contract, and a skill set that doesn't exactly mesh with LeBron James and Anthony Davis. Not that Westbrook doesn't have a positive benefit for the Lakers, but just a few days ago, it was definitely one of the weirdest trades that we've seen. And the Lakers also traded away plenty of their depth just to bring in this one guy. But then suddenly out of nowhere, their offseason went from dark to bright as they brought in Carmelo Anthony, Trevor Ariza, Malik Monk, Kent Bazemore, Kendrick Nunn, re-signed Dwight Howard, and Taylor Horton Tucker. They were able to supplement their lack of depth with plenty of amazing veterans and floor spacers. So I don't think anyone actually told the Grizzlies that free agency had started as they still haven't made any moves yet. They traded up for Zaire Williams, a forward showing a lot of promise, but bringing in Steven Adams and Eric Bledsoe don't really help too much in their win now situation. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if either of them were bought out before the start of the season. Our other big winner of the offseason is the Miami Heat. They may have just restored balance between the East and the West and have immediately shot themselves into a contender position, having one of the best offseasons in the league. Cal Lowry is still one of the better guards in the league, a capable shot creator on the perimeter who won't mess with the flow of the offense. And I love how they were also able to bring in both Jimmy Butler and Duncan Robinson on long-term extensions. PJ Tucker and Markeith Morris are two great 3 and D veterans who both of them I think will fit in well with the Miami Heat culture. And while we don't know exactly what his play is going to look like, having Victor Oladipo planning to return should only help Miami in them continuing to fight and win for next season. For the Milwaukee Bucks, George Hill is planning on returning and he is definitely one of my favorite all around and one of the most solid guards in the league, not really having any weaknesses to his game. Bobby Portis also became a fan favorite in last season's playoff run, and I think many Bucks fans are happy to see him return. While the Timberwolves haven't done too much this offseason, their roster did get a bit younger as they added in Tarian Prince, a 40% three-point shooter. For the New Orleans Pelicans, while losing Lonzo Ball sucks, Devontae Graham is arguably an even better player to replace him with, and Jonas Valanciunas is going to be a noticeable upgrade from Steven Adams. Trey Murphy also looks like a solid shooter who can help space out the floor and should have some polish coming into the league as a junior. For the New York Knicks, this is another team that I think is going to help balance out the East and West power, as the Knicks definitely had a great offseason this year. They retained a large part of their core from last year in Derrick Rose, Nerlens Noel, Trey Burks, and Taj Gibson. And before being traded for the Celtics, Evan Fournier was averaging 20 points per game for the Magic. And for Kemba Walker, I think this is going to be a chance to reinvent himself after his down season last year. I think if he has more control of the offense and more of an opportunity to score on the perimeter, we may get to see that Charlotte Hornet Walker that we all know and love. While they aren't obviously all going to make the roster, you generally set yourself up in a good spot when you draft 10% of an entire draft class. And that's what the Oklahoma City Thunder did here. And I'm sure some of those guys are going to end up in a good position to turn out. Josh Giddy has the makings of being a long point forward who could help create plays and take some of the pressure off of Shea Gilgis Alexander. The Thunder were also able to give Shea Gilgis a max extension this offseason, another move that I think is going to be great for their future because he's going to be a huge factor in their long term plans. I also do love how they were able to shave off Al Horford's contract while adding in Derek Favors. Horford is by no means a bad player, but he's just not the kind of guy that the Thunder really need at the moment. For the Magic, while it is a small upside, Mo Wagner is averaging 11 points per game in 11 games for the Magic last season. 
and Robin Lopez is one of the better post scorers in the league. Jalen Suggs was also one of the top guards in this year's draft, giving the Magic someone they could potentially build around as Suggs has great potential as a playmaker, finisher, and defender. For the 76ers, Firkin Cork Maz is a good 3-point shooter who's going to be essential for spreading out the floor for Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons if he's still there. While Andre Drummond definitely did receive a lot of scrutiny last season in LA, the 76ers did get him with a veteran's minimum. This should allow Philly to keep up a somewhat high level of center play when Embiid is not on the court. The Phoenix Suns definitely had a pretty solid offseason. They were able to keep a large part of their finals appearance team together. While Paul may have been a bit highly paid, it appears that he is going to age well and always going to be a good locker room presence for the next four years. Cameron Payne played incredibly well in the playoffs and it was a great spark off the bench and in the second half of the season. Hopefully he's going to get more playing time this year, and I was surprised to see him back and not take a larger contract in free agency. The Suns also struggled with down low defense and a backup center in the finals. This makes JaVale McGee another solid signing, basically a cheap guy who can run the floor, grab rebounds, and block shots. He's always been one of my favorite centers in the league and should be good for a solid 15 minutes a game. Also Landry Shamit is another good perimeter pickup too. For the Portland Trailblazers, Cody Zeller is another solid center who should be a better defensive option for Portland, a team that has long struggled with defense. Tony Snell is another 3 and D player who can help out with this. Norman Powell is also one of the top scoring guards in the league that might be a good move to keep their offense going by signing him for the next 5 years. Rashawn Holmes has been one of the best young centers in the NBA, and I like the move of the Kings keeping him on the roster. Tristan Thompson is another guy who can kind of complement some of Holmes' weaknesses coming off the bench. Terrence Davis is also a good young guard who showed some promise averaging 11 points in 21 minutes per game last season with the Kings. From the looks of it, the San Antonio Spurs are looking to have a pretty rough offseason, losing Patty Mills, DeMar DeRozan, and Rudy Gay. But I do see this as a bit of a benefit for them. San Antonio has been stuck in a weird spot in their post Kawhi era. Not really contending, but not really rebuilding either. Players like DeMar DeRozan held them up and made them compete for an 8th seed, but prevented the necessary rebuild that San Antonio needs. The Spurs also managed to let go of 3 veterans. All of those guys would have taken up more cap space, and instead this is going to be good for saving money for the future. The Spurs also have a young core to build around with Josh Primo, DeJounte Murray, Keldon Johnson, and $55 million free next season. While the Spurs rebuilding sounds weird, a well-managed retuning with some good signings and some good development from their young guys, something the Spurs are very good at, could have this team competitive again in only a year or two. For the Toronto Raptors, it does suck seeing Kyle Lowry go. I definitely know how much of a fan favorite he was there for Toronto, but Goran Dragic and Precious Achua are a solid package to replace him. I also like the long-term signing of Gary Trent Jr. as he's proved to be one of the best shooters in the NBA last season. Scotty Barnes also showed some promise last season in college as a playmaker and as a one-on-one -on -one defender who I think can replace the role of Lowry in just a few years. For the Utah Jazz, I'm not really sure why their offseason isn't talked enough, but anyways, let's talk about it for a second. Re-signing Mike Conley is huge as he is going to give them some long-term point guard stability. While he may be a little past his prime, Rudy Gay is still a very capable bench scorer. And while he is definitely a controversial center, I can definitely tell you that it's going to be annoying for offenses to have to score on either Rudy Gobert or Hassan Whiteside, assuming Hassan Whiteside actually puts effort into games. Trading for Eric Pascal by only giving up a second round pick. While Pascal did have a bit of a down season last year, scoring 9 points per game, he did have a solid rookie campaign, averaging 14 points, 4 rebounds, 2 assists on a 50% from the field. That trade was a small risk, but a huge upside for the Jazz. And finally, our last team is the Wizards. The Wizards are another team that I think had a really good offseason when it comes down to trades. They of course dumped Westbrook's monstrous contract for Contavious Caldwell Pope, Kyle Kuzma, Montrezl Harrell. Harrell, someone who I've said many times before, has been criminally underutilized in LA. And Kyle Kuzma, a young player who has received a lot of hate, I think he's just in need of a new start and I think there's a chance we could see a bit of a revitalized Kuzma here in Washington. And also to replace Russell Westbrook is Spencer Dinwiddie, a guard who just 
two years ago averaged 20 points and 7 assists for the Brooklyn Nets. This offseason, the Wizards traded for three solid prospects, drafted a young rookie in the top 10, and managed to trade away one of the worst contracts in the NBA. So that is it. That is one positive thing about every NBA team. If you like this video or are interested in other NBA videos, subscribe to the channel. I'll catch the rest of you guys later.